Welcome to Breaking Banks. Welcome back to Breaking Banks. I'm your host, Brett King. In the hosting chair with me today is JP Nichols. Hey, JP. Hello. And uh, we have another host, but he's here as a guest, actually. So, um, Ron Shevlin, welcome back to Breaking Banks. Thanks, Brett. Hey, JP. Great to see you back. Now, um, you know, one of the things uh, that you do as, as part of your alter ego at, at Cornerstone when you're not hosting Breaking Banks is... Um, you, you have done some great research, but you ha- you're a senior columnist with Forbes, right? Senior contributor, yeah. A, a senior c- contributor, right. Um, so you've done a couple of really interesting articles I wanted to sort of dive into, um, but just basically, you know, let's have a chat about where is the U.S. at the moment, you know, post-pandemic in terms of banking, the Silicon Valley bank collapse, and, um, you know, what's happening on sort of digital uh, adoption fronts and so forth in respect to how you see, you know, data on the ground, um, you know, in, in your day job in that respect. So, um, but um, I, I wanted to start with the article, the checking account war is over, if that's okay. Um, you, you uh, I don't want to steal the thunder of the, of the research you did, but do you want to share with the audience, um, you know, what were some of the core, um, you know, points of research that led to that, uh, that headline? Yeah, absolutely. And I should really preface this all by saying I took a lot of grief from a number of folks for the title that the checking account war is over. Um, please remember that, you know, in order to attract viewers and readers, you've, you've got to be a little on the out, you know, right. the, uh, a little bit of clickbait, but a little still bit of clickbait. substantive, a still, little still bit. substantive, right? So it's yeah. not over, over, but it's, uh, well, well, wait a minute. Both of you are underselling this. What's, what's the rest of the title? The checking account war is over, and, and the, fin- the fintechs have won. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best part. <laughs> yeah, so it took a little grief for that one, but basically, you know, look, this goes back actually to. I, to- I think I think it's still correct. I mean, we can run the numbers on it, but um, no, no, know, no, it's the fintechs the are pastors. winning, winning, and, okay, and yeah. it's well, we got to get into it's the data because. Too, right? There's some potentially misleading conclusions that you can come from just looking at the title, of course. But, you know, guys, this actually goes back to 2020 when I had ran a survey of U.S. consumers and asked them at that point, hey, you know, when was the last time you opened up a checking account and who did you open it up with? And I did not ask, you know, primary or any of that kind of stuff. And back in 2020, I was very surprised to see a couple of things that the share of the market of new accounts that were being opened back in 2020, in the first half of 2020, really before the pandemic truly took, you know, really hold, because it didn't really kind of hit until March or so, really Q2. Uh, but the ba- the fintechs were really uh, gaining a lot of share at that point. And by the way, th- that was a lot of neobank stuff back then. Yeah. And um the the mega banks were actually kind of holding ground they were doing fairly well uh it was the regional banks and the the community banks and credit unions that were kind of declining uh over the past couple of years a lot of folks have asked me hey when are you going to do that again when are you going to do that again i finally got around to doing it in a survey that i fielded at the end of june because it, it actually provided a good point you know point in time because it was so, right about the time in mid 2020 when I had done it. So the but new Ron, numbers, was that the fir- was that the first time in in 2020? 2020 you- was the first time I had looked at that. Yeah, like that when I had said, "Tell yeah. me when the last time you opened up an account was in what year?" Um, and I looked three years before, so I did the same thing now, looking three years back. Um, you know, and, and if they said they opened up before 2020, it actually didn't even. Um, uh, publish that data, those data points. So a couple of things that kind of emerged from the new study, the share, the, the digital bank and fintech's share of new account opening, and this is important, this is not the overall market share, it's the share of new account opening, has risen from about a third in 2020 to almost half in, in the first half of 2023. Mm-hmm. Um, both the mega banks and the regional banks have declined uh, and the community banks and the credit unions have 
pretty much remained fairly stable over the past couple of years in terms of the account opening. But the thing that is really, really different in 2023 from 2020 is that I mentioned before in 2020, it was a, a good number of neobanks that were seeing account opening. And in 2023, Chime and PayPal absolutely dominate yeah. the, the share. Uh, Square's got a bit. Um, SoFi has done well as well. Um, but a lot of those smaller neobanks, challenger banks have, have not what, really what seen about Apple, a lot of Marcus? Um, I did not include that as, okay. as one of the prompts. Now, no I do take more grief um, from the folks who go, well, wait a second, PayPal's not a checking account. Um, well, people you can, use it as a checking account. That's exactly. Well, it's the bankers who argue, hey, pay, PayPal shouldn't be in there. It's not a bank I account. I mean, look, look at Jim. Jim basically runs his business on PayPal. Jim uh, yeah. yeah. And he raves about it. So He does. Absolutely. Yeah. But my point is, uh, it doesn't matter what you, the bankers, think. It's what the consumer thinks. And they think they've got a checking account with PayPal or they use it that way. Same thing with Square. Uh, and so that's uh, that's the high level stuff. Well, so, I, I think. Sorry, go ahead, JP. Yeah, I just correct me if I'm wrong. So you, when you started in 2020, you said you look back three years. So you really started kind of looking at 2017. Is that right? Yes. Okay, because what I recall as a consumer and user of your research and one who teaches this at graduate schools of banking, what I recall seeing it from the first time around was it was a little bit more barbell shaped, right? You had the winners at both the mega bank and the digital fintech side. The losers um, all the way through have been the community banks and the credit unions. Um, and so most of this game that you're talking about now from digital banks is really coming from the mega banks. Is that is that correct? And mega banks and the regional large regional banks. Yeah, their share it's is interesting. To... It's the other interesting. thing, and this the is the deposit another... shifted as well, right? The deposits also shifted to the mega banks. I mean, that was a trend that was um, evident well before 2020, of course. But the pandemic, we saw acceleration of that, right? Briefly. Yeah, what you're getting at there, Brett, is and I was going to mention is is sort of the the, the underlying demographics of this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, first of all, three quarters of new accounts, or close to three quarters of new accounts, are opened by Gen Zers and and millennials. So obviously, they're driving a lot of it. But um, you know, my read of the data was that, you know, I asked the question in the article, are the mega banks feeling the, the pressure from this? And I concluded that maybe not, because number one, I mean, they don't see attrition from this. And this is a lot, yeah. a lot of these new account openings are second and third and maybe even fourth accounts at this point. And they, the, the consumers that they, the mega banks do attract tend to be more affluent so they, they may be bringing more deposits with that. Um, and obviously, you know, offering uh, some good rewards and incentives. You know, it's funny. I, I know that the mega banks and well, let's just take Bank of America in general, just because I just saw that they took some heat. I saw a LinkedIn post this weekend. Somebody was saying, you know, they're offering me this great um, incentive to bring, you know, new dollars to the to the bank. But it's still rates that are well below what I could get somewhere else. Well, here's what this person doesn't really know is that, well, if you got enough accounts and enough money at Bank of America, they got a reward program that offers you like 75% bump on the the rewards. So, yeah, you know, yeah. you, right. you got a Merrill Lynch account, a credit card with them, and a bunch of deposits. And you know what? For the, all those advertised low rates, you're actually making out really, really well with, with some of the mega banks. Uh, JP Morgan Chase has always offered, you know, 600 has not always, but for a long time offered $600 uh, to open an account that you, yeah. if you qualify for. Problem is, uh, well, not the problem, but uh, it is mostly geared to folks who can spend enough to earn that $600. So yeah. there are no dummies, you know, and uh, the fact that they're not offering competitive rates is kind of a stupid argument because they're doing damn well. Yeah, well, that's fair enough. Um, what about the uh, the banking crisis has only just begun? Let's. Uh, what was the uh, genesis of of that conversation? Apart from the fact that obviously we just had a, three banks collapse, but well, and the, and 
this is not unrelated to the thing we were just talking about, right? Yeah. The low cost deposits are the lifeblood I was of the traditional a bank. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What spurred that there was a wall street journal article recently titled is the banking crisis over. We're about to find out. And I think what they were referring to was the upcoming uh, and ongoing at this point um, quarterly earnings reports. So they were looking specifically at, you know, what are banks deposit betas and deposit costs going to be if the bond losses were going to take a hit and if they were going to see any impact of real estate loans. And I guess my view was, OK, so whether, you know, we, the banking crisis of 2023 might be over or ending but anybody who's in banking and thinks, okay, shoot, we're, we're out of the woods, it's got to be crazy. I mean, we're looking yeah. at another five to seven years of just, uh, uh, you know, I, I think I titled it out of the frying pan and into the fire. Uh, yeah, you got to, you, you got to, de- like going back to the conversation we just had, you know, we didn't get into this, guys. I think we should. You know, why are younger consumers opening up so many? Uh, of their new accounts with the digital banks and the and, and the um, looking uh, fintechs, for and uh, you know the bankers love to say, well, it's because you know they they have online account opening or digital account opening. Go, yeah, you know, that's not all of it. It's it's a different product. Square right. Cash App is a different product. PayPal's account is a different type of product. Uh, even Chime is you know got a lot of product features that target its its target market. So the banks have got to deal a lot with, you know, new project product design, um, uh, you know, and the other thing they wanted to throw into the article too, it I think is just really going to bring banks down over the next five or so years is the whole core replacement issue or core transformation or core modernization and the, the emergence of what one of my colleagues likes to call zombie cores. Uh, core app, core apps that are no longer being supported or enhanced, uh, and what do you do with that stuff? Um, and then there's another aspect too that I think is going to really kind of drag a lot of banks down for the next five years, and it's the uh, the people problem. You know, attracting high quality people with technology, new emerging technology skills, is has always been a problem for a lot of banks, but I think that problem is going to be real accelerated in the next five years. Yeah, if you're an AI professional, who who would you prefer to work with, Google or a bank? You know, but that's a. I mean, you made it make an interesting point, Ron. You know, part of the ability to have these product innovations and do these different things is that the fintechs use these very agile tech stacks. They're in the cloud. They can plug and play. They can you know boot something up very quickly. Uh, you can't do that with you know you know traditional core type based businesses particularly where your products are defined by the core. Um, and when you put AI in as a layer over top of that, then again, you have the same issue, which is, you know, if you really want to have AI powered banking, you've got to have the capability to plug into all that data and core systems are notoriously unfriendly when it comes to that sort of stuff. So you've got to build an entire data lake or something on top of that. How many banks actually have the financial capability to do that at the moment? You know? Uh, I, well, I think it's a matter of shifting dollars, not necessarily adding dollars. And this is where I think, Brett, you and I will find some agreement. Um, I know that not often, um, so it's good to find we those. We probably agree more than most. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, but, it, it is about shifting dollars away from branch investment, Um you know, you can argue with me Definitely all you want that. and not you, but the bankers can argue with me all they want about how important the branch is, blah, 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 blah. I go, it doesn't matter. You, you have to make the improve the investments and increase the investments in the other channels and the other technologies that money has to come from somewhere. And I say it should come out of the branches. I think the well, branch of the future is a table and a couple of chairs. What's it out? Well, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm working on this new book and um you know, Jim's helping me and Richard Turin and a bunch of others um on branch day gone tomorrow on, on the branch decline that's happening globally right now. And you know, we've we've sort of come to the conclusion in that book that um it was probably sometime around 2018, 2019 that the world hit sort of peak branch. 
Um, and now, if you're going to maintain branches, you really have to do so with the view of how do these branches support the digital future of the bank? You know? Yeah, it doesn't doesn't mean that no one will ever want to come into a branch again, right? No. But um, I mean, I actually take it all the way back to um, you know 1960 and Ted Levitt and marketing myopia, right? He was doing a hundred year retrospect on the railroad industry and how did it, you know, the most dominant industry in the country, right. how did it fade so far so fast? And the his final conclusion was, well, they believe themselves to be in the railroad industry didn't really realize they were in the transportation business. And so they were not disrupted by one major um, technology. It was lots of little things from the growth of the interstate highway system to transmodal shipping to improved air safety for both passengers and freight and so on and so on. And it's sort of the same thing here where so many banks still believe that the important thing is we're in the banking industry. And so the same old tools and metrics and measurements are the only ones that matter. And, you know, some of that is true, but from the customer's perspective, as you just said, Ron, um, they don't care about the customers never said the words or initials DDA right? demand deposit account, right? They customers have jobs to be done. They have pains to avoid and gains to achieve. And, that is the one thing about innovation is how do we bring new ideas to light? And that has happened from all corners over the last 10 or 15 years. And banks never used to face that. Well, just the fact that today more people will open a mobile wallet account around the world than a traditional bank account is in itself such a dramatic shift, you know? Now I know the US is not a hotbed of wallet activity in the same way it is in say China or Indonesia or um, whatever. But um, having said that, that's still a global trend that's fairly clear. And that speaks just to what you've been saying, JP, you know? It's well, like, who would, who would have thought that in 2023, the world's bank account was an app on a phone, you know? Right. And 20 some years from now, or I don't know when, right? it won't be that anymore. It'll be right, the next definitely. iteration of yeah. whatever that is. And, you know, in Smart this Bank article, you talk to. Uh, Ron, in that article, you also uh, hearken back to an, another one of your articles from a few weeks ago, innovation as a management fad is dying. Here's what's next. And, and I agree with you. Uh, in terms of the headline, right, as a management fad. And like you point out that, you know, suddenly everybody's got innovation in their job titles. And in many cases, these are people who are not innovative in the least. They were formerly head of bank operations and now they're chief innovation officer. Um, but the idea of innovation, the definition that I've been using in the classroom and in the boardroom is innovation is simply implementing new ideas that create value. And so thinking about chasing the latest technologies and, um, you know, kind of the fad aspect of this um, is dying, has died, and it really needs to be replaced with a much more functional view of, you know, how do we bring new ideas to market? You know, it's funny you bring this one up, JP, because as I wrote that, and that was actually an idea that I've been carrying around for a good number of months before I finally sat down and wrote that one. But as I wrote it, I kept thinking in the back of my head, man, J.P. Nichols and Jason <laughs> Hendricks are going to absolutely <laughs> hate this and they are going to be on my back for it. And I don't think it was like more than five minutes after I published and Jason pinged me and goes, oh, I totally agree. And I can't believe you're you're writing the things that I've been thinking. But look, let's take this back historically. Um, I hate to admit this. I started my consulting career right before the, the re-engineering boom of the, of the late 80s. And that wasn't even the first management fad that had been out there. There was, you know, had been prior ones. They come and they go. Uh, I remember in a consulting project I did back in the late '80s, where we were doing a strategy for a for a small network uh, uh, network network technology provider, and asking somebody, "So, what's your strategy for the coming year?" And it was like re-engineering and he was literally quoting us from a notepad he had where he was li literally stealing stuff from in search of excellence it was it was it was comical but you know that came and went 
knowledge management came and went. Remember when we had to like suck the knowledge out of people's head in case they got hit by a bus at oh, lunchtime? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then the dot com yeah, boom, yeah. and then the big data boom, and now good to great know, the blockchain you know, boom. The yeah, blo- blockchain I don't even think we're there with the blockchain one yet. <laughs> Um, So these management fads come and go, and typically what it means is that management teams latch on to some idea as a way of getting them out of the doldrums and out of the dumps and things like that. And there was a book that was written back, I think, in the 90s called Beyond the Hype by a couple of Harvard Business School professors. And they argued, and I loved this argument, and it's, it's carried around for a long time, He said, what enables and supports these management fads is when there is a broad uh, opportunity to to define it the way you want it to. So in other words, if you define these things too narrowly, they don't make it. And this is why innovation has um, caught on, JP, because I'm not going to argue with your definition, but I'm not going to argue with anybody else's definition. It's what you wanted to believe. But I was at a conference back in early May. Uh, who's the guy I'm blanking out on his name who co-founded Square with um, Jack Dorsey? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm blanking out. But he gave a, uh, I apologize no, to him, but yeah. he gave a great Mc- presentation. McKinney? McKinney? Um, yeah. Um, and his McElhinney. argument was McElhinney. that innovation is the creation of Jim something. McKelvey. Jim McKelvey. Yeah, Jim McKelvey. Thank McKelvey. you. McKelvey. Yeah, was yeah, the yeah. creation of something new. And when you look at what innovation has been over the past five years in a lot of banks, it's it's not the creation of something new. It's something new to them, Uh, you know, a new system, a new process, a new new whatever. And uh, so a couple of things. I think we're at the end of that life cycle for innovation as a management fad. And I think with the final, you know, finally, we're seeing adoption and utilization of AI tools. And obviously, the generative AI stuff like ChatGPT is really kicking things into gear. But I think here's, here's what I think the important point is, and there's a shift. The innovation that that many banks have attempted in the past five years have been at the organizational level. They've tried to change organizational processes to automate them, digitize them. And I think what's happened is there are a lot of people in banks who have jobs that defy working on transactional type processes, people in legal departments, people in marketing departments, even customer service people, you know, who get presented with a, a challenge, a problem that needs to be fixed, and the script doesn't, doesn't do it. And I think these tools that are emerging enable, and I think the focus is on creativity. How do we improve the creativity of individuals in the organization that don't fit into process automation, process digitization? So I, I ranted a bit here. I'll leave it at that, yeah, yeah. Brett. I think you want to jump in with something. Here. No, no, I, I, I like that. In fact, that sort of is um, that, that's a great segue to how I'd like to close this off, which is, all right, Ron, so now you're a CEO of a bank. You know, what's your move? What would you do? I, 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 you sort of is, laid it out already, right? Well, no, I haven't laid it out. I think my move is to re- figure out um, where my bank is going to compete, for whom and with what. Um, what's my target market and what are the set of products I have to bring in? All this other stuff is enablers and, and tools, but it's not strategy level stuff. The strategy is who do I sell to and what am I selling? Um, and you know, where where am I getting the help <laughs> to do it? Because the partnership aspect is critical. But I think mm. that without, you know, the technology questions are not part of the strategy question. I think that's a good point, because if you look at those teams that are doing some interesting stuff, even JP Morgan, which I know that, you know, they, they have some challenges, but they are they have like 1700 fintech relationships right now. The question is how effectively they're working with them. But having said that, of all the mega banks in the US, they're probably one of the most innovative, um, you know, but. And, and, you know, their entry into the UK market's interesting. We'll see how that works out for them. Yeah, I, I, I mean, Ron, going back quickly to Jim McKelvey's quote, I mean, bringing something that didn't exist before is invention. 
And we don't have to invent to be innovative. And so it really is about solving problems, solving problems for the bank, solving problems for the customer. And if we're focused on that, I'll tell you, for the most part, um, Jason and I have kind of replaced the word innovation in our lexicon with the word growth. Because that's really what we mean yeah. is, yeah. you know, how do you bring new ideas that help your organization grow? And you only do that if you're adding real value to the end users. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. The last thing I want is for banks to create a chief creativity officer role. I'm not sure <laughs> I'm just too crazy about the chief innovation officer role, but I do believe that you, you need a catalyst in the organization. And I do think the chief innovation officers should be looking beyond process automation and digitization to enabling creativity and, you know, enabling the the non-process workers to up, up their games. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I mean, what we have seen and, and external research backs this up is the most successful organizations that innovating and growing have both top down and bottom up. The top down is important because it sets the tone on, hey, we're going to try new things and these are the areas in which we're going to do them. It gives permission to people. But the bottom up, to your point, those are the people closest to the customers or the members who understand the problems that they're trying to solve. And it really is the combination of the two that's what makes it successful. Absolutely. All right. Well, um, on that note, that's probably a good note to wrap. But uh, hey, Ron, um, before we close out the, the segment and go to break, and thanks for joining us. How do people follow your uh, your research and your, your Forbes uh, opinion pieces? Uh, on Forbes, just search for the uh, FinTech Snark Tank, and I'm always publishing stuff on LinkedIn. When's the FinTech Snark Tank book come out? Ah, uh, well, we'll have to talk about that one. Don't know yet. <laughs> All right. Well, let me know if I can help. Um, well, that's it for Breaking Banks this week. Thanks, Ron, for joining us. Thanks, JP, for helping out on the hosting chair. Um, well, we've got another segment to go, so we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with that in a moment. This show is brought to you by Alloy Labs. As much as we love talking on the show, we believe that action is more valuable than talk. Alloy Labs is the industry leader in helping fearless bankers drive exponential growth through collaboration, exclusive partnerships, and powerful network effects that give them an unfair advantage. Learn more at AlloyLabs.com. Alloy Labs, banking unbound. Hey, Greg Palmer here. Welcome to another episode of the Finnovate podcast. We've got an exciting series coming up. We're going to be chatting with our Finnovate Spring Best of Show winners. Always a really fun opportunity to connect with the companies that our audience selected as having the most innovative and creative ideas on stage. And joining me right out of the gate, we have Deepak Jain, CEO and founder of Wink. Deepak, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Greg. It's a pleasure. So uh, to kick things off, obviously, you know, anybody who wants to can go look at the full demo on Finnovate.com and see the full seven minutes. But for those of uh, our audience who haven't seen that, can you give us just some background on yourself and what Wink is all about? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm Deepak Jain, based here in Texas, uh, serial entrepreneur, have found a couple of companies in the payments and security space. Before this one, Wink was started in the summer of uh, 2021, and our uh, area of focus is biometrics, payments, and identity. We are uh, helping companies, institutions of all sizes embrace biometrics to solve uh, consumer experiences that are riddled currently with account fraud, payments fraud, or identity fraud. We are providing a solution to go passwordless and for transactions to happen without needing any information that can be easily hacked. So developing a platform that can be easily deployed by anyone uh, who's interested in utilizing biometrics to transform their user experiences. Yeah, no, it's really cool technology. And I would definitely encourage anybody to take a look at the full demo. Before we get into Wink, though, we need to talk about something else because this is not actually the first company that you've won best of show with. 
on the Finnovate stage. Can you talk a little bit about your last time on our stage? And I mean, I have to also say, this is a very exclusive club. There are not very many people out there who've been to Finnovate twice and won Best of Show, let alone with two different companies that they founded. So this is very impressive. Oh, thank you, Greg. Yes, uh, my previous startup um, company called Switch uh, won Best of Show in 2016. It was a digital gifting platform, and that was a unique experience because we won that award pretty much in our very first year of um, uh, Switch being founded. And it was a fantastic experience to receive that validation from the audience and as well as the investors and potential customers that were attending the show. We were also able to meet some great uh, peers in the industry and really were able to use that to uh, drive a lot of visibility about that innovation that was in the digital gifting space. And uh, really the experience all in all was fantastic, which really led us to uh, do this again with uh, with me. So uh, yeah. I'm really glad to be able to... Uh, to win it again with uh, with a different company. Yeah, well, certainly the experience the last time obviously set you up well. Let's dive into Wink a little bit more here because I think it's important that people understand what the technology is. A lot of companies are active in the biometric identity and payment spaces. How do you think you know, Wink is different? What sets Wink apart? Uh, well, there are various things that set us apart. The first point that I would like to mention is our is our experience and track record and positioning in the market. As I mentioned, we have been in the payments and security space for many, many years, myself uh, in uh, 20 plus years. We have collected a team of people who have come from uh, companies like Visa and MasterCard. Uh, We know exactly how things are shaping up for biometrics in the payments arena with uh, with the roadmap that the large payment networks and the large financial institutions are are looking at, so so we really really have a deep understanding of what the roadmap is. Also, in my last startup, I had a opportunity to work with some of the largest retailers uh, in our platform that were participating in e-commerce, and we got a first-hand knowledge of what are some of the unsolved areas in terms of fraud prevention and uh, and the role of biometrics that can solve those. So we come from a vantage point that a lot of startups don't have access to. That makes us different in how we design and, and create the product that can be, that can have a, a large scale success. Secondly, the technology that we have put behind the platform with respect to utilizing machine learning and AI Combining various different facts, uh, factors of biometric, facial recognition, uh, voice recognition, device recognition, and applying it to your common everyday experience of logging into a new website or enrolling into a new account or making a purchase in e-commerce or making a purchase in a retail store. These are everyday experiences. A lot of companies focus on just the mobile app and they don't have a, the breadth of of uh, technology, how we utilize uh, AI behind uh, knowing that somebody's face might be uh, might be blocked or he's wearing a sunglass or a hat. Now how do you then utilize voice recognition? How do you use liveness detection to differentiate between a live voice versus a voice coming out of a speaker? How do you use AI, the lighting in the room, to actually differentiate between a live person on the camera versus somebody replaying uh, a recorded video or or, uh, using a deep fake generated by a software? How do you insert... um, different AI mechanisms, use generative AI, which is what we're using in our voice recognition algorithms to always prompt the user to speak something slightly different uh, and to look for 
active keyword phrases in that technology to again differentiate between a recorded audio versus a, a, a real person speaking. So all of that deep tech with AI that we are utilizing makes us very different. And the fact that we never fall back to a password or a pin code, which a lot of other AI companies or even biometric companies do, is if their facial recognition system fails, they fa- they drop down to your password or your pin yeah. code, which then which then leaves the door open for hackers to to you know step around the the biometrics. So the way we designed it, from the knowledge and the vantage point that we have from our team, and the technology that we have put, um, sets us apart. And then our mission also sets us apart, which is really trying to look at the consumer engagement and see where it's going. Uh, it's no longer restricted to your phone. As you saw yesterday, Apple's announcement of a Vision Pro, they are using something called Optic ID, which takes a look at your iris, and that's how it recognizes it's you versus somebody else. So the fact that the consumer engagement is going beyond the mobile phone or the mobile app, it's going into VR, it's going into connected cars, it's going into smart homes. You're seeing self-checkout terminals at retail stores. You're seeing, you know, automated check-in at the airports. These are all, you know, moving beyond the mobile phone. So a lot of yeah. current companies in the biometrics are solely focused on a mobile app. Um, while we have developed the technology to convert any camera, irrespective of what device it's on, what use case it's being used to into being capable of doing secure biometric authentication and payments. That really yeah. sets us apart as well. No, that, that last piece I think is really interesting. And here's where obviously the restrictions of the Finnovate demo, we weren't able to show everything that you could do. Obviously we're not able to bring a car up there on stage to show kind of the connected car side of it. Can you talk a little bit about all the different environments that you're working in and, and why you think it's so crucial that you're able to be in all those different environments? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, um, the mobile phone, while it is a great piece of technology, but it's a very, very difficult for, for user experiences to, to be always, all the time being reliant on the mobile phone, which is where we decided to, uh, to unveil our technology in partnership with Qualcomm at CES this year in January, where we showed our technology running in a car. Uh, And, you know, a driver-facing camera is very important for the next generation of cars, for driver safety, for ensuring that you are not being drowsy and that you are paying attention to the road. And the same type of safety needs to be there if you are paying for something while you are talking to someone. So this concept of hands-free payments, you can't rely on a mobile phone, right? Yeah. It's that completely goes against the grain when we talk about you know driver safety. So to being able to use a camera in the car to not only recognize the driver so that you can personalize the car based on who you are, to power experiences where you can make a rental car your own car and all your subscriptions, your Spotify and everything gets loaded once you're recognized with the camera or even in commercial fleets where the same fleet is being driven by different drivers. They can actually lock the driver into the, into the truck. There are many types of applications that can, that can use the camera in the vehicle to not just do, um, driver recognition, but also driver payments. Now that yeah. every car is coming with a Siri or an Alexa or a Google Assistant built in, you talk to your car, you're paying attention, you know, so th- those are all great experiences that this technology can power. And then it can yeah. go beyond the car into a smart home as well. You know, when you are in your home, you're already recognized, you've logged into your TV or your smart TV or your appliance. You don't have to go back and hunt for your mobile phone and make a transaction when you can do that uh, with any of those smart devices. So again, our technology can power 
those type of experiences. So I, I go back to the to our vision and our, you know of what our thesis is that more and more consumers are going to make transactions on smart devices outside of the mobile phone, you know, and uh, yeah. that's where our technology can can really make a difference. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's really cool. One thing I will say, though, I always enjoy getting into a rental car and clicking all the radio presets and judging whoever was in there before on their terrible taste in music. So I don't know if I want it necessarily to <laughs> automatically log into mine. I enjoy uh, that little feeling of superiority. I'm like, you were listening to that? Come on. Um, but no, it is it is really interesting. So um, I, we, we are running out of time. I do just want to quickly touch on um, one thing before we get to our, our last question, um, you know, how much of this is live and in the market right now? Uh, I think that's a really crucial piece is understanding where you are in the cycle. So really quickly there, and then we'll kind of end with a hopefully fun one. Yeah, no, I, I said it's our second year um, in, in, in business. We have spent a good amount of time developing the tech and perfecting the AI and really, as you show, saw in the demo, showing the vast variety of use cases that we can power. Now we are in the stage of uh, alpha and beta trials with several large institutions. I mentioned the one with Qualcomm. We are working with a very large payment network on integrating our biometrics technology with e-commerce payments. We are also working with a very large uh, e-commerce platform that has over 50,000 merchants and unveiling our technology where any of that merchant can simply install the technology without writing any line of code and have access to the superior, highly secure, uh, passwordless payment um, experience over there. So this technology is is coming. It's going to be yeah. in in a variety of uh, uh, places where you you'll start seeing it very soon. Cool. Now, certainly, big things on the horizon, and obviously, all that activity is really positive for yourselves. I want to end uh, by by kind of zooming way out. I think there is a perception sometimes, and this comes from maybe science fiction movies or books, that some of this technology, you know, relying on biometrics for payments or other aspects can bring about some, you know, dystopian consequences, for lack of a better word. Now, obviously, this is fiction. This is coming from a place where, you know, the, the movie Minority Report, I think, maybe left uh, some mental scars on a lot of people when when you think about this kind of technology. How real are these concerns about some of these dangers when you talk about biometrics and payments? Is this something which you know you are concerned about, or is it something which you think has been largely overblown by some of the the different pieces of media that are out there? Yeah, I mean, to be to be honest, uh, we rely on our past experience, our close cooperation with the large payment networks and the and the large banks and the the very sophisticated knowledge that we have of what the regulators and the privacy uh, you know watchdogs and everybody is concerned about so we have designed the technology in such a way that this becomes more of a protector than uh, than a, a risk for most consumers, and these are things like uh, making sure that a uh, consumer enrolls voluntarily into a system where their biometrics are being uh, recorded for the purpose of future authentication, where a customer has full rights to uh, you know withdraw and de- and get their information deleted. Uh, to proper cybersecurity, uh, third-party lab certifications that ensure that uh, no raw video or image you know, of a consumer is stored anywhere that could be vulnerable or susceptible to uh, to attacks, and and really going through the industry, um, uh, you know, uh, cooperation to make sure that this is a safe infrastructure. And consumers have shown willingness to adopt infrastructures like these and solutions like these when they are properly implemented. And an example is is your airport, uh, your check-in and your immigration uh, uh, facilities where uh, when you enroll someone uh, with the intent of solving a clear problem, uh, consumers are willing to participate. So my answer to that is a biometric solution properly implemented with the right 
architecture and the right privacy uh, guidelines in mind, which is what we have done, is actually a very safe environment. And it actually can protect you versus risking anything. Uh, yeah. Obviously, there are a lot of people, especially in the social media world, that have tried to use biometrics for against the user permissions to do things that uh, sort of give the industry uh, a little bit of pause of what might be some of the ill effects of biometrics. But once again, a proper implementation is what we are looking to achieve and have achieved to an extent that's going to make this a much safer thing to to adopt than anything yeah. else. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's that's really the crucial piece is doing it in uh, in a compliant way, in a way where you're working with regulators and, and also working with the end users, because I think this is an area that gets frequently overlooked in the fintech space, this kind of communicating to the customers. And I myself found myself in a position, uh, I was watching a hockey game at the Climate Pledge Arena here in Seattle, which is you know, really Climate Pledge is just Amazon. Everybody knows it, but they like to pretend that they're green. So, okay, have at it. It's the Climate Pledge Arena. And I was in one of these stores where it was, you know, scan your credit card when you go in and then pick up something and leave. And I was in a frame of mind in that moment where I was kind of in the store before I really thought about it. And then after I left, I was thinking, well, where does my image go now? How much uh, How much are they able to store here? And so I was able, because you know I'm kind of wired this way, I went and looked up uh, some of the fine print later on and figured out, okay, they only store it for 48 hours and some of these other pieces. Um, but that was never communicated to me as part of the process. And I think that this is a really crucial step in having people come in and enjoy that kind of experience. And it, it was a really cool experience, but I would have felt a lot better about it if I had known exactly what was happening there. And some people don't need that. And I and I think that's their right. But this is, I think, a really crucial aspect of this. So anybody who's considering getting into this space, I would say, make sure you're properly communicating with people about what you're doing, why you're doing it, so that you don't end up with someone kind of walking out of there with, I just wanted a beer. Hold on, where did my face go? Who has access to my credit card information from here? So um, really interesting topic to be thinking about. Again, check out the seven minute video available on finnovate.com slash videos. The company is called Wink. We've been talking with Deepak Jain. Deepak, thank you so much for taking the time to chat through everything with me. Thank you, Greg. Really enjoyed it. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks.